In this fourth and final episode of the series, we'll describe our attempts to trace the materials and remains removed from the Furson Mound Group, set on a ridge along the west bank of the Fox River in St. Charles, Illinois. And we'll piece together what the excavations of these mounds has taught us. As we described in the first episode, the first documented excavation of this mound group was the 1877 dig by a group of archaeological amateurs and enthusiasts from Geneva, Illinois, just to the south of St. Charles. Over the course of a few days of digging, this group removed a quantity of ceramic sherds, projectile points, and bone tools, as well as the inhumation remains of four individuals in the lower portions of the mound and the disarticulated bones of at least 10 individuals, likely in the form of bundle burials, in the upper strata of the mound. As we reported, a portion of these artifacts, including skeletal remains, were sent to William Bross of the Chicago Historical Society, while the remainder were presumably retained by members of the group that dubbed themselves the Kane County Archaeological Society. We have contacted the Chicago Historical Society on a few occasions over the past several months to determine whether they retain any materials or records associated with this dig from Fox Valley finds, from Furson Mounds, or from any other linkage to this site, and we have yet to receive any responses from them. We have also explored the fate of the materials that may have been retained by the 1877 Geneva Group, comprising the Kane County Archaeological Society. By examining biographical information related to these men, as well as newspaper clippings, hoping to get a glimpse of a mention of skeletal remains, potsherds, or projectile points. Nothing has surfaced as yet, however. The Geneva Historical Society was kind enough to check their collections and have indicated that they have no record of donations of similar materials or any such materials related to these men's families. Although a large amount of material was removed during the 1877 quarrying of the southernmost mound of the mound group, including the skeletal remains of at least 14 individuals, we have been unable to trace the disposition of any of it. In the mid-1960s, Bob Matson, a local archaeology enthusiast, attempted a semi-formal dig into the second larger mound, to the north of the mound from the 1877 dig. Bob unearthed and removed two skeletons, one a flexed inhumation burial and the second a bundle burial. He found few artifacts beyond these human remains. Mr. Matson donated these finds to the St. Charles History Museum, which was then housed in the St. Charles Municipal Building at 2 East Main Street in St. Charles, Illinois, and which retained these skeletons within their collection at that time. We'll talk more about that when we discuss the findings of later excavations. In 1971, Anne Marie Early, the anthropology graduate student from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, made a few test pits between the mounds, as well as a slightly larger pit in the southeast corner of the North Mound, removing well over 250 ceramic sherds, as well as stone flakes, from what she interpreted as a refuse pit or midden. We recently contacted the anthropology collections at the University of Massachusetts, and they were kind enough to check their holdings, and they too reported that they had no record of that material. The most recent documented excavation of these mounds was done in the spring and summer of 1972 with the College of DuPage-sponsored dig led by Charles Ellenbaum, with whom we've spoken at length. The 1972 dig removed more than 900 pottery sherds a quantity of lithic flakes, three skeletons related to three inhumation burials, as well as partial skeletons from three bundle burials and two or three cremation burials. The ceramic sherds and lithics from this excavation were retained by the College of DuPage Anthropology Department for a number of years, at least through the mid-1980s. We know this because Brian Barty, then an instructor at COD, was familiar with these artifacts and undertook a study to identify their cultural affiliations. However, since that time, these artifacts appear to have disappeared, as representatives from the COD Anthropology Department have been unable to locate them within their current collections. Regarding the human skeletal remains for six individuals removed from the first mounds during the 1972 dig, 
From records provided by the St. Charles History Museum, we know that some or all of those materials were held by the Allen family, the owners of the property, until January of 1981, at which point they donated some or all of this material to the St. Charles History Museum, with a collection of human remains that included femurs, tibias, fibulas, patellas, scapulas, ribs, radii, and ulnas. Note that the donation documentation did not mention skulls, humeri, or pelvic bones, which we might have expected, as some were definitely removed as part of the 1972 excavation. We should note, too, that as a part of this 1981 donation, the Allen family also turned over their copy of the preliminary report of the 1972 excavation, written by Charles Allenbaum and others. Since the COD team was excavating this mound at the request of the Allen family, the Allen family was provided with this report early on, prior to Chuck Allenbaum turning over his excavation notes and materials to the provost of his college following the shutdown of the 1972 excavation as a result of the American Indian protests. Chuck Allenbaum had not seen this full report since he had provided it to the Allen family in the early 1970s and was delighted to gaze upon it once more when the St. Charles History Museum found it in their files. As of the early 1980s, the St. Charles History Museum held at least two fairly complete skeletons, earlier donated by Bob Matson, as well as the skeletal remains sans some critical pieces from multiple individuals donated by the Allen family. We also know that the St. Charles History Museum included at least one of these skeletons in their displays from the early to mid-1980s while in residence at the St. Charles Municipal Building. But here again, cultural attitudes and norms regarding Native Americans and artifacts related to their ancestors were shifting within the United States. Some American Indians took offense at the manner in which the remains of their ancestors were being treated and put on display in museums and educational institutions across the country. Some may remember this coming to a head at the Dixon Mound State Museum in Fulton County, Illinois, in the early 1990s. This museum had started out as a private institution in the 1920s, owned by the Dixon family, but due to its cultural importance, was taken over by the state of Illinois in 1972 with the construction of a modern new museum, the centerpiece being the mound display with dozens of human skeletons displayed in situ within a partially excavated mound, enabling visitors to see them up close and in great detail. Native American groups protested the open display of these human remains, believing it to be deeply disrespectful to them and to their ancestors. I'm old enough to remember this display at the Dixon Mounds Museum, as my parents took us there on multiple day trips when I was a boy. Admittedly, it was a thrill for me to see the museum's excavated mound display, and it fired my young imagination into a lifelong interest in this topic. Nonetheless, as a result of American Indian protests and growing public sentiment, the portion of the museum displaying more than 200 skeletons was finally closed down in 1992 by then-Illinois Governor Jim Edgar. The Illinois State Dixon Mounds Museum was one of the last remaining institutions in the U.S. to openly display Native American skeletal remains. The protest and removal of the display erupted into a national controversy and served as a cautionary tale to any museum or educational institution still holding Native American artifacts or human remains. Only a few years earlier, in response to more than a century of excavation and informal looting of Native American mounds and sacred sites across the United States, both from trophy hunters and archaeologists, the growing protests of various Native American groups resulted in the NAGPRA legislation, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, enacted in 1990. To this day, this legislation ensures the appropriate accounting, protection, and repatriation of human remains and cultural artifacts, especially those related to state and federal lands and institutions, to existing representative Native American groups and tribes. In anticipation of the emerging NAGPRA legislation, in the early 1990s, the St. Charles History Museum transferred all of their Native American skeletal remains to the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency, 
which at that time oversaw the Illinois State Museums, meaning that the ISM was subsequently responsible for the disposition of these remains, as per NAGPRA. Our understanding is that the Illinois State Museum still retains these Fearson Mound remains, but they have plans to repatriate them in the future. So at this point, we can now say that we have successfully traced most of the remains removed in the past 60 years or so from the Fearson Mound Group. However, we are still very much in the dark as to the skeletal materials removed during the 1877 excavation. Nor can we trace what happened to any of the ceramic sherds, stone flakes, or bone tools that emerged from the Fersen Mound digs. We had initially hoped that the St. Charles History Museum might retain at least a portion of these materials, and the museum kindly invited us to spend a few days examining their finds, along with Chuck Ellenbaum and Brian Barty. We learned that the museum does indeed have an extensive and impressive collection of Native American artifacts. But after careful review of all the materials, we were able to determine that the vast majority were donations from local private collections with Kane County provenance, but not specifically associated with the Furson Mounds. Nonetheless, we highly encourage people to take the opportunity to see the St. Charles History Museum collection, as it provides an excellent cross-section of the cultures that inhabited the Fox Valley for thousands of years extending into the archaic and paleo periods of occupation. We should also mention that one of our viewers had noted that they grew up close by the mounds, and that one day, years after the 1972 excavation, that this person, along with their father, had escorted a visitor across their property to the Fearson Mound area, where the visitor then conducted an artifacts reburial ceremony. And perhaps that small ceremony included some of the missing remains or material for which we've been searching. We'd like to think so. Admittedly, it has been a somewhat challenging experience tracing the materials and remains removed from the First and Mound group. If anything, our experience has underscored why NAGPRA is so vitally important. After multiple months of research, we have only been able to trace the remains of about half of the individuals removed from these burial mounds and that effort has been aided by NAGPRA-related tracking and documentation, and specifically for those remains removed in more recent excavations. Prior to that, institutions and private collectors treated Native American human remains in a somewhat cavalier manner. Human remains and artifacts simply disappeared, ending up as trophies in personal collections, piled loosely in bags stuffed in closets or storage lockers, and sometimes even discarded. The NAGPRA legislation finally provided Native Americans the means of tracking, repatriating, and ensuring that their ancestors' remains were treated with respect. As we've seen with other Native American sites in the region, there is also a paucity of formal documentation related to the St. Charles site. The exception was Anne Marie Early, who to her credit, formally published her finds and results regarding her 1971 Fearson Mound test pits in her 1973 PhD dissertation. The 1972 College of DuPage excavation resulted in a draft preliminary report on the findings, but was hamstrung in a more formal report due to the actions of the then COD management. But as we've seen with the Winfield Mounds and other area sites excavated in this time frame, the general lack of publishing appears to have been a pattern, even when the excavation was undertaken with the best of intentions. And so why are we whinging on about formally documenting these scarce and rapidly disappearing sites? Why is it so important? Perhaps one of the better answers to that question comes from the late Mick Aston, an archaeologist from the University of Bristol, United Kingdom. I don't think many people realise this, but, but in the end, archaeology is destruction. You have to take the site apart to understand it. And if people in future are going to understand it, then you've got to leave a lot of good records. So there's got to be good plans, good sections, notes about it all, photographs, so that in theory, somebody could come back and at least mentally put the site back together. And so, having attempted to put the site back together in this series of videos, based on newspaper articles, dissertations, informal conversations, and preliminary reports, what can we say about the Fersen Mound site, its cultural affiliations, its usage over time, 
and the world in which it existed 1,000 years ago or more. What in the end does the archaeology tell us? As described in previous videos, the burial evidence and the associated artifacts suggest at least two, possibly three, major cultural affiliations with this mound group. The log structure burial hinted at in Mound A, as well as the inhumation burials in the lower levels of both Mounds A and B, suggest a middle woodland tradition, possibly with cultural ties to Hopewell. The mound size and structure, as well as their positioning in the landscape, also strongly suggests middle woodland tradition. The pottery sherds associated with these burials and stratification likewise indicates middle woodland with cultural ties to Havana Hopewell, meaning that these burial mounds were likely first built approximately 2,000 years ago, perhaps to serve a small community of Native Americans, consisting of three or four extended families who yearly moved across the landscape and camping in one place for perhaps a season or two before moving on to other areas to take advantage of different resources in each locale. Archaeologists tell us that the Middle Woodland tradition extended from approximately 200 BCE to 500 CE and would have replaced the late Archaic and early Woodland traditions that we know to have existed in the Fox Valley before then. How do we know that? The rich trove of Archaic-type projectile points in the St. Charles History Museum collection tells us that such communities existed in this area for thousands of years. But what characterizes a Middle Woodland tradition relative to some of these earlier ways of living. Archaeologists tell us that there are multiple attributes, including more use of ceramic pottery, better quality and more highly decorated ceramic pottery, the beginnings of agriculture and more settled communities, and increased trade networks across the middle of the North American continent. The evidence of raw copper and the mineral mica in the St. Charles History Museum collection hints at the trade networks that were leveraged by the Fox Valley peoples of that time. Middle Woodland and specifically Havana Hopewell cultures also developed distinctive styles in pottery decoration and projectile points, such as Snyder points. Were these archaic and Middle Woodland projectile points evidence of usage of the bow and arrow? Referencing the excellent videos put out by the University of Illinois Extension regarding Illinois projectile points, the short answer is no. Most of these projectile points would have been much too large to be hafted to an arrow. So most, if not all, of the projectile points that we see from the middle woodland to earlier times would have been for atlatls or spear darts, or for larger spears. Bow and arrow technology was not taken up by Native American peoples until approximately 600 CE, or until the late woodland tradition evolved in the region. And we know from the Fearson Mound evidence, the peoples of the Fox Valley and the Fearson Mound area were of late woodland cultural affiliation as well, which is generally dated by archaeologists from 500 CE to about 1000 CE. Recall the bundle burials and cremation burials which were found in both mounds A and B, in which Brian Barty noted late woodland ceramics. Anne Early also found evidence of late woodland ceramics in her 1971 trenches in field walking specifically of the Langford tradition, which would take the site right up to the edge of colonial and historic times. We've also seen that the St. Charles History Museum collection includes late woodland or Mississippian arrowheads, which are distinctive in their small size and fine blades, better suited to an arrow. More indications that late woodland and Mississippian peoples were in the Fox Valley area. In addition to the bow and arrow use in hunting game, Late woodland peoples also made greater use of agriculture, and in their diets included more maize, which we equate with corn, as well as beans and squash. In some late woodland and Mississippian settlements, this increased use of agriculture allowed for larger and more permanent villages. But there is as of yet no evidence from the first and mound area to suggest either permanent or large villages which suggests that they only made limited use of agriculture for their sustenance, or perhaps a more permanent village site in the area has yet to be found. And as we describe the various cultural affiliations of the Fearson Mound area, from archaic to late woodland cultures, this is not to suggest that new peoples were moving into the area with each new cultural tradition. 
That is one possibility, of course. But it's also very possible, if not more probable, that the same people lived here for thousands of years, evolving and adapting to new cultural styles and practices, with occasional outside influences, either from trade or intermarriage or the occasional conquest by neighboring groups. And in the continued use of the fearsome mounds for funerary practices and their reuse and respect of the sacred space for thousands of years, we can see continuity of culture, deep-rooted traditions and beliefs that sustained their life cycle pathways. What finally can be said about the Furson Mound site in the present day? What possible role can it play in our lives, far removed from the traditions of these early Native Americans? As we've already noted, the Furson Mound site has been a sacred place for thousands of years, in the same way that our present day cemeteries are sacred, places of remembrance and reflection, places where we reconnect with the dead. As Chuck Ellenbaum noted, we should view these ancient mound sites as an indelible part of our prehistory and history, both the good and the bad aspects of that, as we are the present stewards of this landscape. And as stewards, we should ensure that these mounds remain undisturbed and undeveloped. Today, this mound site remains protected on private property, but we would hope someday that it might pass into the hands of a public organization or governmental body that can work to restore it to a semblance of its original aspect and thereby make it more accessible to the present day inhabitants of the land. Hi, we hope you've enjoyed this video series and that it's given you something to think about, especially those of you who might find yourselves driving along Route 31 here in St. Charles, Illinois. And we'd like to thank all the folks that helped us put this video series together, including Chuck Allenbaum of Geneva, Illinois, Brian Barty of Lyons Township High School, the folks at the St. Charles History Museum, especially Lindsay Judd, the folks at the Illinois State Museum, uh, especially Brooke Morgan, and the folks at the Illinois State Archaeological Survey, especially Paula Perubkin and Tom Label. And we'd also like to thank Bob Matson of St. Charles, Illinois. Please like and subscribe and share the videos and leave us a comment. We really do like hearing from you.